creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. On today's program, we're going to be looking at the evolution of computer hardware, from mainframes to minis to micros. We'll see some examples of the oldest mainframe computers, and we'll take a look at one of the newest microcomputers, the HP 150 from Hewlett Packard. Gary, are we at the end of the line in the evolution of computer hardware, or are there major new phases of this evolutionary process still to come? Well, fortunately, we're obviously not at the end, at the end of the line. We're at some point in time in the evolution of our of uh, using, say, microprocessors as general purpose computers. And they're just getting smaller, faster, less power, and most importantly, they're less expensive than they ever have been. I guess the logical conclusion is they get so small that you lose them like you do your keys. <laughs> but as far as evolutionary trends, there are a lot of new things happening with microprocessors. Uh, use of microprocessors as controllers for, let's say, um, intelligent devices such as a wheelchair that finds its way around and, uh, under microprocessor control. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that are going to happen that will be off the mainstream of using computers as general purpose computers as well. Okay, to start our look at the evolution of microcomputers and mainframes and minis, we went to Boston to visit the Computer Museum. Established in 1979, the Computer Museum houses the most extensive collection of early computers in the world. Its galleries feature some of the earliest known calculators, like the Pascaline, invented by the French mathematician Blaise Pascal in 1642. The Pascaline stored numbers on ten little rotating dials, moving one dial up to ten, moved the next dial one notch, and so on. It was the first consistently reliable example of a computing machine. In the late 1800s, Herman Hollerith devised a card punch calculator to speed the tabulation of the 1890 census. The cards were hand punched, but electrically read a concept that showed up much later in the earliest IBM machines and is still used occasionally today. The forerunners of modern computers didn't appear until the late 1930s and 1940s. The Whirlwind, of which only a few parts remain, was a massive machine, covering 3,000 square feet and weighing over three tons. The heat given off by its 18,000 tubes required constant monitoring, and in spite of its great mass, the Whirlwind's processing capacity was about the same as a present-day 16-bit microprocessor. It was not until the invention of the transistor in 1947 that a new era of smaller, more efficient computers became a reality. This is the TX-0, the world's first general-purpose computer using transistors. And it still works. We'll see a demonstration coming up next. The TX-0 was an experiment in transistorization, the first solid-state general-purpose computer. Its transistors were encased in little removable tubes so that they could be easily checked. Designed and built at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1956, the machine used a modest 5,000 watts of power. Punch tape served as an input device, rewound by hand after each use. Although the machine was transistorized, it was and still is very sensitive to heat and will only run if the temperature stays below 80 degrees. The TX-0 was equipped with some very modern peripherals, a video screen and a light pen. A half-inch video game program involving a mouse with a memory, threading its way through a maze to reach a piece of cheese. TX-0 was built at Lincoln Laboratory, and the notion was to test two ideas. One was uh, transistorized uh, circuitry, and the second thing that it was designed to do was to test a very large memory. And it, um, it did that very well, and, and then it was used, then it was, then it was moved, moved to MIT uh, for, uh, for real use. But 
its its role really was a circuit te circuit tester and a and a, and a and a memory tester. Displayed in the computer museum's lobby are some of the biggest solid state machines ever made: supercomputers, the IBM Stretch, Control Data 6600, and the ILIAC 4 represented the most powerful class of computers of their time. Well, the ILIAC uh, began with some ideas in the early 60s for uh, doing a lot of computing in parallel. And the idea behind ILIAC is to have a number of processing elements, uh, in this case 64 processing elements, each with uh, a small amount of memory, and then to have a single instruction that executes, uh, that, that operates on all of that data in parallel, so that in fact you get speed by this massive parallelism. ILIAC's main effect was to, was as byproducts to, uh, they, they stimulated the use of uh, semiconductor memory. Uh, it also stimulated the idea to make faster machines and the fact that uh, fast machines were really important uh, in a whole, whole bunch of applications. The development of integrated circuits paved the way for faster, smaller, more powerful machines and the mini computers of the 1960s. But what was considered small in those days bears little resemblance to what we call personal today. Some people consider this link computer to be the first truly personal computer. It has a keyboard, it has a CRT, it even has mass storage devices. But this part was only the terminal. This, in fact, was the computer. And in the days of this computer, this was considered portable because it was on wheels. Mini computers were a major breakthrough, equaled only by the appearance of microcomputers in the next decade. Progress in very large scale integration of circuits promises even further size reductions and increased processing capacity. But the future holds more than just a change in the relationship between power, size, and speed. Well, I think the the next sets of challenges that we, we have right now are going to be integrating video and television and voice into, into machines. And I, I think that those are, are beginning to, to happen uh, to a reasonable uh, degree. Um, and maybe I can't, I can't predict whether the video disc will, will come in or, or not, uh, or whether that kind of... Uh, how, how important that technology is going to be. But I think just the notion of storing pictures and operating on those pictures, that's kind of the next frontier. Herb Lechner has joined us. Uh, Herb is Vice President for Information Systems and Administration at uh, SRI International. Uh, Herb's got quite a background in computing. Uh, it goes back several years. I understand you programmed the ENIAC at one time. And that's right. Here. <laughs> so, uh, we our title is uh, mainframes to minis to micros. Could you give us some idea, of, just for general information, what these different kinds of computer systems are all about? Uh, I'm not sure, Gary, that there is a precise definition because uh, yesterday's mainframe is today's micro from a performance point of view. But I think that uh, we normally think of the mainframe as being the faster, high-end computer system that we find in uh, scientific research. And we certainly think of the micro as being a personal computer which does one application at a time for one person. And somehow or the other, the minis get kind of compressed in between. In talking about these three different types, sir, will, will three different kinds of computers continue? I mean, is there a reason to continue to have mainframes and minis and micros? Or do you see, like, micros taking over with the kind of job that minis did in the past? I think we'll continue to see the spread both in the high end and in the low end of the computer line. There's a constant demand for faster and faster machines. The Japanese fifth generation objectives is a, a clear uh, evidence of that. While at the same time, now that we have broadened and matured the computer field to encompass the home and the office and the individual, I'm sure we'll see a push to the downside also. In fact, if you take a look at just some of the recent uh, developments, I guess, in microprocessors, uh, there's quite an emphasis on uh, data communications to mainframes, getting out to uh, information services, and this seems to be some sort of a coupling of the mainframe use with the microcomputers. So, uh, so, there's some is, uh, so there's some synergism there for sure. That's right. Some people have commented that the advent of the microcomputer is merely a spreading of the components of the mainframe system over a larger area. <laughs>
Speaking of synergism, Gary, uh, I'd be interested maybe both of you could talk to this because CPM is one key factor in what I'm about to ask you. Uh, how, was there a synergism between operating languages, operating systems, or software in general, and the evolution of hardware? Well, I think definitely the software has played a key role uh, in the evolution of hardware. And in the markets that these various classes of machines service, I think we see that very clearly. Uh, in the mainframe area, the more powerful computers with many more peripheral devices and disks and tapes will service multiple users at the same time. And the software has to be massive and somewhat complex to support that. Whereas in the small side, we're seeing a trend towards simpler software, easier to use software that services the needs of an individual. Well, I think also in the, at least in small computer evolution, it's been sort of, it's been an evolution that's been paralleled, has uh, paralleled the large computer systems and new computer systems to a large extent. And I think that nowadays there's some breaking away from that. Uh, the mainframe world is, is many times batch or uh, time sharing oriented. And now with small computer systems, we're looking at more of an emphasis on, say, real-time control, uh, more that you, the kinds of things you'd find in an industrial control environment or even in a home. So there is some, I think, differences there that are, some differences that are starting to show up. Yes. yes Her, Herb, uh, not trying to date you, but you were with IBM in the 50s, I mean, the early days of this stuff. I'd just be curious, did, did you guys envision at that time that in the early 80s, computers would be where they are right now and that we'd have made this kind of progress, this kind of evolution? Well, uh, I certainly didn't. And uh, I can recall uh, in the days of the 702, we wondered if we would ever uh, sell 30 such systems uh, in the entire uh, United States market. So clearly we did not have our sights set on the proliferation of computing we've seen today. Well, it's interesting. Just, uh, just the other day I saw uh, a small computer system. I can't say exactly what kind it was, but, but it was running PL1, and it was uh, the kind that you can put in your briefcase. So there definitely has been some change in the... Uh, characteristics of computers. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a walk down nostalgia lane to, to uh, see the museum and think back to the days when we had an installation team of 17 people sent out to uh, install a computer over a year that my kids handle in their spare time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of the newest thing, in just a moment we're going to take a look at uh, one of the newest examples of a microcomputer, the HP 150. It's a computer where your fingers can do the talking. <laughs> Okay, joining us now is Cyril Yansuni. Cyril is the general manager of the personal computer group at Hewlett Packard. And Cyril, we mentioned that the HP 150 is a good example of one of the newest microcomputers in the field. Maybe you could run a demonstration program uh, for us and, and particularly point out the new technology aspects of it. Yes, I'd like to do that very much. Um, I think when we uh, set up to design uh, the HP 150, uh, we had in mind the uh, professional user, but the user who is uh, sophisticated in the use of information, but not sophisticated at all in the use, direct use of a computer tool. Uh, so we really focused on uh, uh, developing a technology and a total approach for a very intuitive use of a personal computer. And what we have embedded in uh, the HP 150, the most visible part is uh, what we call touchscreen capability. The fact that you can interact directly with the personal computer without accessing the keyboard by basically using what is the most intuitive tool that you have, basically using your finger to point and select um, objects or select things on the screen. Could, could you show us with, like, with what you have up there? I would like to show you what we have on the screen there. What we have on the screen there is what I call an electronic Rolodex. Uh, we all are very familiar with the Rolodex on our desk. It's a set of cards and you can turn wheels back and forth until you see the right name as an example appears in front of you. We can do exactly the same thing here. I have an electronic Rolodex. It appears very much like a Rolodex on the screen, and I can move it up. I can move it down just by pointing on the wheel on, uh, on the screen. I can go and select a name. Let's suppose that now I have uh, the set of names, and I want to select a name there. I have Stuart Chaffee name there. I can just select that card, and, and, and the Rolodex opens there, and I get all the information that I have uh, embedded in the product on uh, Stuart Chauffeur. I have his address, his phone number, and so on. As a matter of fact, if what I want to do next is call him, I just uh, indicate that I want to dial the phone. And uh, if I had the modem attached to the product here through a phone, I would automatically dial, dial the phone. So uh, let's go back to uh, the Rolodex. And uh, you can see then I can really roll it up, and I can roll it down, and I can do quite a few uh, things. 
can recall, again, just by pointing uh, the application, I can recall uh, the specific program that I could have selected, again, just by pointing to the screen, another application. Is, is touch screen is not really new as a technology. It's kind of a, a new application of this in this computer. Is that right? That's absolutely true. Touch screen is not new to technology, uh, and it's not a new technology. It has been used uh, on terminals mostly as, again, a pointing and a selection device. What we have done there is really embedding very well the touch screen capability of the product with the software, with the application, and really trying to see everywhere we could replace keyboard access by basically pointing directly to the screen. So do you see a, a shift from using a keyboard to using touch, touch uh, screen, this touch screen display? For example, uh, well, uh, we have lots and lots of applications that are written for small computer systems, and uh, how are you going to get all those programs to move over to a touch screen? Okay, uh, I think that uh, the way we have designed the product, in fact, is by allowing very simply current and existing application to basically use a touchscreen capability. The product itself has built the ability to recognize if you are putting your finger and really uh, selecting either a specific place uh, where, uh, where you want to put your finger on or an area where you have your finger uh, in that specific area. So you don't really have to burden the application itself by all that. It's really basically repla replacing the movement of cursor. Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, instead of having to move the cursor with your uh, with a keyboard or with any other device, you can really point to it directly with your finger. One of the criticisms though has been that, uh, that holding your finger up there in your arm would be kind of tiring. In fact, I heard somebody say that there was a attachment they, they thought was going to come out for the <laughs> HP 150, which is the little armrest, and hold your arm up there while you're touching it. How do you, is that? Is there a problem with that, or is uh, that just a uh, rumor? <laughs> so all the studies that we have that we have made, and we have very extensively tested the product, obviously before. Uh, uh, we put it on the market, show that this is really not a true, a true problem. You don't really spend a lot of time with your hands up there and pointing to, to, to the screen. Um, I have my, my, myself a, a pretty good feeling that the ideal user interface, as a matter of fact, doesn't really exist. It's really going to come out of the combination and a lot of experimentation of a lot of the user interface that today exists, like touch screen, like ability to move a cursor through a mouse or a tablet, probably one day also using voice. And I think it's going to be a combination of all those different user interfaces applied to very optimally to some specific type of application. I think there are going to be a good matching of the kind of user interface with the kind of application. So I think it's going to be a combination of all those user interfaces which are really going to make another step forward in user friendliness. Mm -hmm. I, I see two things looking at that machine that seem uh, new in technology. So you've got micro floppies on there rather than the traditional five and a quarter inch. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Also, there's a printer sitting in the monitor, which is something I haven't seen before. That's right. I like to uh, maybe I'll start by the printer and then we'll go to the micro floppy. Let me give you a good example of of the nice the nicety of really having a printer built in. As you as you can see, as a matter of fact, it doesn't even appear. It's really building the product there. It's user installable. It takes a minute or two from any user user to basically get receive its, his printer and put it in, and install it in the product. Let's take a good example. Let's suppose, in fact, I, I really want to go back and reselect uh, this card. It's, uh, again, your, your card, uh, Stuart. It has information. I'd like to have a hard copy of that information. I'll just go and say print card, and uh, my printer is really going to start printing that card, and in a couple of seconds, we'll be able to tear it out mm -hmm. there and, and give it to you. The micro floppy, uh, it's an area where we also believe there that we are kind of pushing the technology. We're using, as a matter of fact, a three and a half inch uh, technology. And I think that I have one, one in, uh, in my pocket here. It is a kind of semi rigid uh, micro floppies. Um, it's, as you said, different than the five and a quarter, but has today basically uh, the same density, the same capacity as a bigger five and a quarter disk. As time goes on, as a matter of fact, we think over the next uh, several months, we see significant improvement in the capacity of those products, doubling and even quadrupling the capacity of those micro floppies, probably even getting to the range of a megabyte that you can basically carry with you. This is really the ideal, uh, we think, personal uh, uh, mass uh, storage uh, media. Uh, we have also seen tremendous reliability improvement using those kind of products, and one can really see why the semi-rigidity, the fact that it has an auto shutter, uh, so in some, in some sense, you never have outside contact with, with the media itself. Herb, we, we've seen an example, and Cyril's been showing us here, of, of one of the newer versions of a microcomputer. Where would things be going after that? We talked with Gary at the very beginning of the show about what's the next step. Uh, it, it will be in the direction that Cyril mentioned of uh, more user-friendliness, as we tend to say. What's, what's the next stage in this evolution of hardware? 
Well, I think that uh, there are a couple of trends that we see evolving. Clearly, making the computer easier to use and making more software available that is easier to use is one of the trends. Another trend seems to be, especially in the business environment, networking the computers together. Because given your own computer and being able to do many things on that computer, it seems like this almost commands the next step as being, now let us interchange data between computer users, and uh, we see the local area networks and networking becoming a factor. I, I would agree with you on, on some of those points. I think that most of the networking, though, is going to be more in, the, in data communications over telephone lines, that is, linking the office or the home and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a tremendous network uh, throughout the whole world that is based on telephone system, and uh, I think we're going to just see a lot more evolution in that direction. But LANs have had a lot of problems in just setting up the networks, and they're very expensive. So. But I agree with you. I agree, I agree uh, 100 percent with that. I think that in fact we do have this network system, which is our telephone uh, systems. I also think there is another reason, in my opinion, we're going to see this very good matching between telephone networks and, and computers and personal computers, mm -hmm. is the integration of voice kind of capability as a user interface within uh, personal computers. And in that case, it makes even more sense then to be able to share basically the same media to transport your information, it's data information, it's text, it's also your voice. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. Cyril Suni of Hewlett Packard and Herb Lechner of SRI, thanks very much for being with us. On behalf of Gary Kildall, I'm Stuart Chaffee, hoping you'll join us again next week for another edition of the Computer Chronicles. visual programming tools for software development is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.